Dateline, Atlantic City, New Jersey, June 1952. When two women get together, that's conversation. When 9,000 women get together and a few men too, that's news. This is John Daly reporting and this is the story. Here in this coastal city on New Jersey's share of the Atlantic during the week of June 16, 1952, the nurses of this country and other countries met in biennial convention. Also at the convention were friends of nurses and board members of public health nursing services and schools of nursing. They came here from every one of the 48 states, from the District of Columbia, from the territories of Hawaii, Puerto Rico and Alaska. They came here from every branch of the armed services. Forty-five of them spoke for 26 foreign countries on every continent of the globe, sort of a United Nations of nursing. Over a thousand were student nurses from 43 states and two territories. They signed in according to their membership in their four major nursing organizations, the National League of Nursing Education, organized way back in 1893, when the well-dressed nurse looked like this. The American Nurses Association started in 1896. The National Organization for Public Health Nursing begun in 1912 when Milady Nurse and Milady Board Member were decked out like this. and the Association of Collegiate Schools of Nursing, the baby organization born in 1933. Also taking part in the convention were the members of the National Association of Colored Graduate Nurses, dissolved in 1951. Among other activities, they were to see one of the biggest and most diversified technical exhibitions ever put together, 164 separate exhibits. And, of course, they were to chat and eat and walk and swim. But the big purpose of this gathering, the big news being buzzed about on the boardwalk and now at the first sessions, was the plan to reorganize, to merge into two basic groups. One, the American Nurses Association standing for the interest of nurses. The other, the National League for Nursing standing for the interests of nursing. Pearl McIver, chairman of the Joint Coordinating Committee on Structure, put the proposition to the delegates. The final achievement which will contribute greatly to nursing progress is the completion of the plans for the reorganization of the structure of professional nursing. The proposed plans which we will vote upon at this convention call for two national nursing organizations. One strong organization of, by, and for professional nurses will have full responsibility for those functions which the members of a profession should perform for themselves. The second organization will be unique. For the first time in nursing history, all nurses from every occupational field will have the opportunity and the responsibility to plan jointly with allied professional workers and the consumers of our product for the best utilization, distribution, and financial support of nursing services and nursing education facilities. Our new plan of organization offers each and every nurse unlimited opportunities to reach her maximum professional potentialities as an individual practitioner. It will also offer every nurse an opportunity to participate fully as a member of the health team, which will play such an important role in promoting the brotherhood of men throughout the world. Brotherhood of Man, 
That's a concept. A good one, but still a concept. And nurses are pretty down-to-earth people. And so, in discussion on the proposition at an open forum, the natural and inevitable question came quickly. Just what will reorganization accomplish? What will it do for the members? Miss Favreau will answer that question. First, instead of four national organizations concerned with various phases of professional nursing, there will be only two. No longer will it be necessary to have the cumbersome joint machinery that we have had in the past. Second, the program of the American Nurses Association will be greatly expanded, giving nurses in all fields of nursing and in all types of positions an even greater opportunity than at present to promote their professional development and welfare. Third, nurses in all types of positions and in all fields of nursing will be able to work with members of allied professional groups and with community leaders in developing and improving organized nursing services and educational programs in nursing. Up to now, not all nurses have had such an opportunity. Fourth, in addition to working with other groups on matters that are of concern to all of nursing, special interest groups can also concentrate on problems that are peculiar to their special areas. Fifth, new horizons can be opened up. For instance, in the NLN, it will be possible to further the development and improvement of organized nursing services in hospitals. This is an area that has not been fully covered by the present national nursing organizations. Sixth, and most important, reorganization of the national nursing organizations will benefit the people of the United States. Both organizations, the ANA and the NLN, will be working toward the ultimate goal of better nursing service for the people. After discussion came deliberation. The delegates gathered at meetings of their own organizations and listened to their president's keynote the several and official attitudes. This new plan could bring more aggressive action on common problems by getting rid of overlapping. Elizabeth K. Porter, president of the American Nurses Association, explained. In the short space of six years, we have made very encouraging progress when you consider that we live in a profession beset by age-old traditions and customs which are not likely laid aside. We have had necessarily to proceed slowly, recognizing that nursing has responsibilities far greater and graver than most other groups. In the new structure, the American Nurses Association can be only as strong as individuals are strong for collective action and that strength must be fostered in district and state groups. The individual nurse in the association is an important entity. Just as, as a citizen, she needs to be informed and to make her influence felt, so as a nurse, she needs to be an informed, committed, and alerted for action member of her local, state, and national associations. In such a union of our professional associations, it is believed that overlapping can be eliminated, that attention can be more economically and effectively focused on overall problems and interests, and also on the concerns of special interest groups, and that the end result will be a nursing service suited to the need of this modern world, which we hope will eventually be a united society. Now, to meet the new problems and responsibilities that have grown out of two world wars, a world neighborhood, social changes, scientific progress, more aggressive programs in the world of nursing are necessary if our profession is to move forward. To say yes or no to the new plan meant making a decision that would affect millions of silent members. Agnes Gelinas, president of the National League of Nursing Education, put it this way. The decision we are to make this week is a great responsibility for us, the members of the National League of Nursing Education in convention assembled. It is a decision in which each League member who is here will participate, one which cannot 
and should not be delegated to a board, a committee, or any other limited group. For the responsibility of decision is ours equally, just as the League is ours equally. In a wider sense, however, the League is not ours alone. It truly belongs to many people, to our predecessors out of whose selfless devotion this organization was founded and built, to those who will inherit from us the cause of nursing education, to the future generations of nurses for whose adequate preparation we are ever concerned, to the people of this country and of the world for whose welfare the National League of Nursing Education has always existed. These are the people, the silent league members, if you wish, whom we must consider in our decision on the future structure of organized nursing. Their ideals, their hopes, their best interests must guide each one of us as we vote. The new plan would bring the individual nurse closer to her national organization, said Emily G. Sargent, president of the National Organization for Public Health Nursing. The National Organization for Public Health Nursing looks forward at each biennial convention to the opportunity of discussing with its members the work done and the work to be done for improving public health nursing service and public health nursing education in this country. This year is more than ever aware of the importance of matters to be considered at these meetings. The proposed change in the structure will bring us as individual members even closer to our national organization through state affiliations. Agency membership, a kind of membership not new to NOPHN, will have even broader meaning in the National League for Nursing. Under one board of directors, with a division for nursing service and a division for nursing education, the interest and experience of these two groups will be more closely knit than was possible when we were divided into several different organizations. We are embarked upon an interesting and challenging undertaking. Proud as we are of the progress made in the past 40 years, we look forward to even greater achievement in the years to come. Under the new plan, the individual nurse would be able to contribute more. Elizabeth Bixler, president of the Association of Collegiate Schools of Nursing, told how. Twenty years ago, the Association of Collegiate Schools of Nursing was only a gleam in the eyes of its parents. Today we meet, perhaps for the last time, as a separate organization. During recent years, we have taken our place as one of the little three of the six national nursing organizations. Our board of directors has served as an integral part of the joint board. Our representatives have served on many joint committees. And our structure committee has done its share in the structure reorganization, which is the main topic of discussion this week. We look forward today to taking our place in a new organization if our members and others indicate their desire to form the National League for Nursing. I am convinced that as individuals we can give more if we are not dissipating our energies among three or four or six professional organizations. The cause of nursing education on a true collegiate basis, now so well established, will be strengthened if we who believe so firmly in this cause act as part of a greater whole, remembering that the whole is greater than the sum of all its parts. Here's what it seemed to boil down to. The way it worked now, every organization had a board. Representatives of these boards made up a joint board. Then there were joint committees and a steering committee. Complicated? Very. Under the new plan, there would be two organizations. One for nurses, one for nursing. And a coordinating council. As simple as this.
Now, Pearl MacIver reported for the Joint Coordinating Committee on Structure. The revisions and plans which you will consider and act upon represent more than six years of study, discussion, and decision. The proposals are not to be written in tablets of stone. The bylaws of each organization can and no doubt will be revised at each biennial convention as experience points the way to new developments. Your committee believes that the proposals contained in the revisions of the ANA bylaws and in the new constitution and bylaws for the National League for Nursing represent workable plans which will promote the further development of both nurses and nursing. Therefore, the Joint Coordinating Committee on Structure of all the participating organizations rep recommended that you approve the general plans for the American Nurses Association and for the National League for Nursing as outlined in the April 1952 issue of the American Journal of Nursing, subject to later consideration of the bylaws. Throughout the week, the new plan was discussed in open meetings and during the breaks in private conversations. Now the time for decision had come. We now have the report of the chairman of Tellers. The bylaws require a two-thirds vote for the adoption of the bylaws. There are 406 in favor and three opposed to the adoption of the bylaws. Since we have two-thirds vote of those voting, the bylaws are adopted and the National League for Nursing is created. In each of the four organizations, the answer was yes. A decision had been made. What did it mean? Two organizations had emerged, an expanded American Nurses Association and a new National League for Nursing. What would they do? The principal functions of the ANA will be these. One to define standards of practice within the occupational fields of nursing. Two, to improve working conditions. To this point, Shirley Titus spoke. Six years ago, the House of Delegates established what has been known as the ANA Economic Security Program. During the last 25 or 50 years, when other groups have been demanding their place in the sun, nurses have continued to accept the status quo. World War II, with the inflation that was its concomitant, woke nurses to the fact that things were far from well within the nursing world. The siphoning off of nurses from civilian hospitals to the military increased the already long working hours of the nurse and materially added to her workload. Employers of nurses failed to voluntarily adjust nurses' salaries upward in accordance with the rise in the cost of living, or to realistically recognize in the paycheck the longer hours and the heavier workload made necessary by understaffing. The, the speaker went on to say that the direct result of all this was accelerated turnover, dropouts, and mass resignations. These are the conditions which the ANA is striving to correct. Three, carry on an intergroup relations program. Listen to Mabel Stauffers, the last president of the National Association of Colored Graduate Nurses. One of the agreements between the boards of the American Nurses Association and the National Association of Colored Graduate Nurses at the time of the dissolution of the latter organization was that the Mary Mahoney Medal, which had been awarded by the National Association of Colored Graduate Nurses, be continued. Ever since 1936, this medal, named in honor of Mary Mahoney, the first Negro woman to graduate from a school of nursing, has been presented to a nurse or citizen who worked to improve the professional status of Negroes in nursing, to foster democracy in professional nursing organizations and the community. Mrs. Margaret Cress Jackson, who is receiving this award tonight, has done all of these things. 
Mrs. Jackson for many years served as a member of the board of the National Association of Colored Graduate Nurses. At the time of the dissolution of this organization, she was its treasurer. She, through her community activities and her work with the Visiting Nurse Service of New York, has done a great deal of work for nursing. Her patience and her understanding has made many genuine friends for Negroes in nursing and has meant the creation of new opportunities for Negro nurses. For these reasons, Mrs. Jackson, I am truly honored to have been afforded the opportunity to present to you the Mary Mahoney Award. Four, promote legislation to improve the quantity and quality of nursing practice. Five, carry on research to implement the ANA program. Six, provide professional counseling service to individual nurses and to their employers. Seven, represent American nurses in the International Council of Nurses. Some of the functions of the new National League for Nursing will be one, to work with members of the community to help them meet their nursing needs. Two, study the kind of education nurses need. Mary Shields of the National League of Nursing Education spoke to this point. Last winter, the Committee on Nursing Curricula of the National League of Nursing Education got the opinions of many nurses on these questions. What abilities does a nurse need? What personal qualities should we expect in a nurse graduating from an educational program called basic professional? In order to answer the questions, these checklists were sent out to nurses working in schools of nursing, hospitals, public health nursing services, and as private practitioners. More than 3,000 answers have been summarized. This has helped to define our aims and point the way to next steps. Participants have said that they want the next steps to help answer this question. What level of skill should the professional nurse have in relation to her specific functions? For example, would you expect the nurse to have a beginning level of skill, a moderately advanced level of skill, or a high level of skill in, say, sizing up the health problems and needs of her patients? If we are to answer this question, we must have the help of the people who do nursing as well as the people who teach nursing. Three promote the establishment and improvement of nursing services in communities. A sociodrama illustrated the way in which close cooperation between hospital and public health nursing services would help bring this about. A nurse discusses with a hospital patient her aftercare nursing needs. She follows through at the hospital with the patient's family. Back at home, a public health nurse visits the patient and puts the plan into effect. Four, promote the organization and improvement of educational programs in nursing. This includes accrediting these programs. Five, advise nursing agencies, colleges, and communities on the establishment of nursing schools and educational programs. Six, interest young people in choosing nursing as a career. During this convention, student nurses made their decision to form a national organization under the Coordinating Council of the ANA and the NLN. It was quite a story. A convention on the seashore, one organization revised, a new one created. Two newly elected presidents ready to work together. Meetings, speeches, the usual props of any convention. But behind it all, a purpose to give better nursing service to the people who need it. To the accomplishment of this purpose, 9,000 nurses and friends of nursing, speaking for themselves and some 300,000 of their colleagues, have given their pledge.
Yes, it was quite a story.